and cheers everyone. I am Christy from Y and Wine. I am Mikhail George. I'm the author of Speak Easy, Speak Love. And we are here today to celebrate the launch of Mikhail's debut novel, Speak Easy, Speak Love, like she said, which comes out today. And so <laughs> to celebrate, we are going to make some Hey Nani Nani cocktails and we're going to show you some simple steps on how you can make one yourself if you are of legal drinking age. <laughs> so, Mikkel, do you want to tell everyone why we're calling them Hey Nani Nani cocktails? Yes, so my book is a retelling of Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing set in a 1920s speakeasy on Long Island. And the speakeasy is called Hey Nani Nani, which is actually from the play Much Ado About Nothing. It's a song that they kind of sing. Um, that you let all your all your woes and troubles into Hey Nani Nani. And it's so much fun. So without further ado, here are five simple steps so you can make your own Hey Nani Nani cocktail. Step one, pour half a glass of strawberry lemonade, which we have right here. Um, okay, should I pour yours too? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Uh, that's half, right? Totally. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, All right. Step two for the other half of your glass with pink champagne of your choice. Seems like it should be more than half. <laughs> uh, the bigger half is the alcoholic half. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. Step three, add a strawberry as a garnish. So, do we have a knife? Oh, oh they're, oh, they're already cut. They are cut and ready to go. Ta-da! Ta-da! Okay. <laughs> Step four, add a squeeze of lemon. <laughs> Ooh. All right. Okay, oh, step five, stir. Ooh, oh, <laughs> that's exciting. <laughs> uh, all right. Looks good. Okay. And <laughs> last step is enjoy. Cheers. Cheers. All right, let's see how these are. Oh, yeah. These are good. <laughs> they are really good. Okay, so I absolutely love Speakeasy Speak Love. From the cool 20s setting <laughs> to the incredible characters and all the witty banter and dialogue that you wrote in here. It's just so much fun. So do you want to start by telling readers a little bit about what the book's all about? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you. You're so sweet. Um, and yeah, so it's a retelling of Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing set in a 1920s speakeasy that is dying and they're trying to save it. Um, and if you don't know Shakespeare's play, um, it is one of his comedies and the basic setup is that there's two couples, one couple fall instantly in love and then they get deceived and so things happen. The other couple, which is like low-key the main couple, even though they're not billed as such, um, is Beatrice and Benedict and they hate each other and they fight all the time and then because their friends play some tricks on them, they like kind of fall in love for reals. Um, so basically it's a romantic comedy set in a really super fun decade of the 1920s when so much cool stuff was happening, particularly prohibition and bootlegging and stuff. So. Yeah, it is so much fun. Like if you want to read a book with lots of fun quotes and just funny one-liners, like this is a great book <laughs> to read. So you mentioned Shakespeare and how this is a retelling of what to do about nothing. So can you tell us a little bit about what got you into Shakespeare to begin with? Uh, yeah, so I actually hated Shakespeare in high school. We studied a couple of the tragedies like Romeo and Juliet and Julius Caesar and Macbeth. And every time we had to study it in class, I was like, I hate Shakespeare so much. I don't understand any of it. None of this is realistic. It's just I don't, I don't get it at all. And I was an English major in college, and you have to take 
Shakespeare, Milton, or Chaucer, and I was dead set on taking Milton so I could avoid Shakespeare altogether, but then I took a study abroad in the UK, and you have to take Shakespeare because you go to the Globe and you go to Stratford-upon-Avon, um, where Shakespeare was born and died. And luckily I had a really great professor who kind of emphasized that Shakespeare can be interpreted all kinds of different ways and that mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of modern applications to his plays. And I went on this study abroad and I loved it. Like we went to tons of different plays. We went um, in Stratford-upon-Avon, the Royal Shakespeare Company. That's so we went cool. to like the Globe. Yeah, it was so great. Um, I got like stage blood on me from Titus Andronicus, That's a and great story. yeah, and when it was when we went to the Tempest, um, the guy who plays uh, Anthony like wrung out his cod piece as they're called like their costume like right by my head because I was like sitting down in like the peasant area of the stage. Anyway, I just super loved it, and I just uh, I really really wanted to do something with Shakespeare. I kind of mm -hmm. want to add my I wanted to add my voice to this huge. Um, kind of uh, history of adaptations. And Much Ado About Nothing has always been the only Shakespeare play that I never hated. Um, right. It was the only one that I like, that I was like, okay, I don't like Shakespeare, but I like Much Ado About right. Nothing. Because um, I love so much about it. And to me, Much Ado About Nothing is a feminist play because you have two types of womanhood in Beatrice and Hero. Mm -hmm. So I decided to set it in the 1920s because that is to me is a feminist decade because women had just gotten the vote and there was the emergence of the flapper and all this kind of cool stuff that was happening um, and femininity was changing in the United States. So it was a really fun decade to play around with the themes of the play, I guess. There's so many fun elements with, I mean, yeah. like the Shakespeare much to do about nothing retelling and all those fun characters. And then to have the historical fiction element as well, it's just such a fun, yeah. fun book and such a cool concept. There's, well, <laughs> I mean, I had, a, I, lot of, I had a lot of good material at my fingertips, right? I don't feel that bad because Shakespeare was also plagiarizing everyone. <laughs> so he was like stealing his own concepts. Um, but yeah, there's just, there's so much material um, in the 1920s to play around with. And it was actually, part of the challenge was choosing what to focus on and what to leave out. Okay. So. so one of the things you did focus on is the Hey Nani Nani yes. speakeasy <laughs> that we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. So when you were doing your research, did you come across any like actual 1920 speakeasies that you would have wanted to go back and visit or get to have a night yeah. town out in? So yeah, so I researched a lot of speakeasies actually, and actually there wasn't that many. So Hey Nani Nani is in Long Island. There uh -huh. actually wasn't that many in Long Island really? because they had a lot of parties there, but people were really, really rich on Long Island. That This okay. is the Great Gatsby culture, okay, the like okay. huge parties. And they're like, we would never be so crass as to charge you for our alcohol. We'll just give it to you. So I like their style. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the parties on Long Island were not technically speakeasies, even though there was alcohol because they didn't, if you got invited, you just, you know, got to drink. Right. Um, so uh, before I did my research, I liked a lot of kind of well-known clubs like the Cotton Club and stuff. But when I did my research, uh, I would learn things like, well, actually they only had, they only allowed a white audience, even though their entertainment was primarily African American. Um, wow. And they kind of promoted a lot of like racist themes of the time, even uh -huh. though, even though they were the launching pad for a lot of um, African American entertainers. And there was just um, things like that, or it would turn out that, you know, the owner of the club was really anti-Semitic or he had, um, you know, rigged the world. There was just a lot of dark, like a kind of dark underbelly. So wow. I would say the speakeasy that I would visit would be the 300 Club. Okay. Um, that was um, ran and owned by the first female um, hostess MC. Uh, her stage name was Texas Gwinnon, and she would greet everyone with hello suckers, which I gave to Hero in the play. And a lot of Hero's catchphrases as the hostess of Hey Nani Nani. Um, are inspired by Texas okay. women because I was say, um, she sounds like someone I know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So she was really cool. She was, um, yeah, one of the first women to own her club, and 
even though the only illegal part of her club was the selling and distribution of alcohol. Everything okay. else was, I mean, she didn't do prostitution, she didn't do weapon racketeering, anything like that. Um, and she got arrested several times and would be let out the same day because somebody would provide her bail or she had the like prohibition agents in her pockets. Um, wow. So she was never in jail for long and she was a really cool, funny um, lady. So I think I'd go to the, the 300 Club. Sorry, uh -huh. that was a really long answer. No, she sounds fascinating. Um, yeah, yeah, she's a cool, she was a cool historical character. What draws you to writing retellings or historical fiction? Oh, okay. So retellings, um, retellings I like because there's a kind of sort of community feeling in telling a retelling, whether you're doing a fairy tale retelling or a classic retelling. Um, people already know this story. Not everyone does, but a lot mm -hmm. of people do. Right. Um, and it really feels like you're not building up this sandcastle from scratch. You're kind of coming into a party that already exists. And okay. you're sort of listening to what people are saying about it and taking those like emotional core things that hooked you about the story. Um, and it, it's kind of like a fan letter almost being like, this is why I loved this original. Um, and this is what I have to add to it. And this is, um, you know, I, I want to make you love this story too. So here's the ways that I would like take it. So it feels like a kind of group undertaking, even mm -hmm. when you're working all by yourself. Um, like I watched a lot of adaptations of Much Ado About Nothing and I've okay. seen it on stage like five times. That's fun, That's fun <laughs> so, to research to do. Yeah, that. yeah. So it's kind of it's it's kind of fun and kind of seeing the different ways people and there's even like other young adult books that are based on Much Do About Nothing and seeing how they tackle it and what they have to say about it and kind of knowing that we all sort of love these characters and mm -hmm. we're all kind of like part of this non official fan club, which is which is a lot of fun. It's sort of like a community thing. Um as for historical fiction, I just love I just love history. Uh, I think that there's a lot of cool things, and it's really fun to kind of find the human elements that connect us all. Because that's sort of how you pull modern readers into the past with you, is by saying, "Okay, well, when you were 18, probably you weren't running a speakeasy, and probably." Um, you know, you weren't dealing with like, well, can I even get into college as a woman or, um, you know, this or that. But, but we do feel things like I'm, I'm worried about my future. I, I feel this new pressure uh, with the dynamics that have changed in my family or I feel this need to protect those around me and I feel like I'm blocked in and um, boxed in by things that are outside of my control. So those mm -hmm. kind of things are like all human things that we feel and kind of finding ways to tease those out um, in historical settings. Uh, it's like it's like almost a like subgenre of fantasy because it, it doesn't feel immediately real because we've right. never experienced it. Um, and yet it was real, which kind of makes it cooler, I think. So, yeah. <laughs> so is the 20s your favorite decade, would you say, then? Um, yeah, I am kind of a big fan of the whole early 20th century. So mm -hmm. pretty much from like 1895 to probably right before World War II. That's my favorite, favorite okay. era. Um, so I do love the 1920s. It's one of my favorites, but I like the whole, that whole 30 year period, um, which just changed the world again and again and again. Like when you see those videos of like inventions that changed the world or moments in history that changed the world, there's like a huge concentrated pack of them in these decades. Um, and they're so cool. So, they are, yeah, they're I like so it. cool. Yeah, and it's right at that time where you can still find like actual photographs and actual recordings and actual um, documentation, which you can't, which is a lot harder when you're doing like a medieval period mm -hmm. or a more ancient kind of historical period. And there's just so, so much fun. I mean, I know, surprise, given my blog name, but I love the whole mm -hmm. idea of speakeasies. It just sounds like so yeah. much fun and something that would have been so cool to experience. Yeah, it was really a weird, and I feel like we experienced just a touch of that sometimes in our politics today where it was a law and yet nobody really took it seriously. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone was kind of surprised when the 18th Amendment passed the first time. It was like, what? And um, you know, you just, it was, they call it the great experiment because, 
you can't you can't legislate morals. You can't right. try to dictate to people what's right and wrong for them. I mean, does it work? It actually yeah, clearly it blows up work. in your face. Yeah, <laughs> and prohibition really created organized crime in America too. So it like literally had like the reverse effect of what they wanted. Yeah. So oh, that's so interesting. Yeah. So my last question for you: Can you tell us anything about the projects you're working on now? Yes, so I have actually been doing a lot of work on a retelling of The Tempest, which is my second favorite um, Shakespeare play, and awesome. yeah, we thought it would maybe kind of go along with this one, yeah. and what I love about that play is it's a revenge play, and it's one of the handful of Shakespeare plays where there's magic in okay. it, um, and Ariel, who is this non-human character, is kind of the one who says, well, if I had a heart if I had a human heart, I would maybe back off of these guys a little bit. And that's when Prospero decides to not, like, fulfill his revenge plot anymore. And I've always really loved the dynamic between Ariel and Prospero. That's the most interesting part of the play. So my retelling kind of focuses on their relationship. And I'm also working on a sort of diesel punk reimagining of the Arthurian legend. Oh wow. Yeah, that so like cool. so like I said my favorite my favorite time period is like the 1900s to the 1930s uh -huh. roundabout. Um so I don't call it steampunk because it's not in the Victorian age, but there's like airships and this really old city that's kind of like old New York um as it was entering the 20th century. Um which is yeah, it's just like a cool time period so it's kind of gritty and dark and it's yeah a reimagining of King Arthur and Merlin okay. and Excalibur wow. and stuff with airships yeah so I'm really excited about that one but um yeah I don't know where that one will go yet <laughs> that sounds fun I've never heard of diesel punk before but I am intrigued yeah they cut I mean well like steampunk right because it's like steam powered uh -huh. stuff okay and diesel punk because it's engine powered because now in the early 1900s, uh -huh. engines had been invented, um, so that's kind of the difference, is I guess technology. Okay. Yeah. So in my book, someone is building the first motorized plane. You know, like the Wright brothers uh -huh. in the plane, which I think is so fascinating because the Wright brothers built this plane in like 1905, and then World War One started, and they thought, oh, we're just going to use it for like reconnaissance and stuff. We're just going to use it to like. Um, deliver messages like it's a fast way to deliver messages and then it turned into this new way of warfare and there were all these dog fights and these um, ace ace pilots uh -huh. who uh, were basically like killing each other in the sky and that whole like technology jump was really fascinating and kind of like sad because it propelled like the way we kill each other onto a whole new level right um, which it wasn't intended for, but that's what it became anyway. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's what I'm working on right now. Wow, I can't wait to read them. Those sound like so much fun. Yeah, they're a little different than Speakeasy Speak Love, yeah. but I don't usually write the same book, the same genre twice, which I don't know if my publicity team loves because <laughs> it's harder to market, but... But you've got to have that kind of differentiation when you're yeah. trying to be creative and come up with new things and keep yourself entertained as a writer so yeah and I'm not one of those writers that gets bucket loads of ideas like and they just oh well I just gotta focus on one I get like one and then I'm like okay coddle it <laughs> <laughs> and like and like nurture it because uh, they only come ever so often so yeah <laughs> well that's awesome I can't wait to read those yeah and in the meantime, be sure to pick up your copy of Speakeasy Speak Love out today. Mikkel is actually doing an event at one of our local indies, the King's English, this Saturday. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have links below for how you can add this book to your Goodreads shelf and also how you can pre-order your own signed copy of Speakeasy Speak Love yes. from the King's English. Mm -hmm. And thank you guys so much for watching. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Mikkel, thank you <laughs> for taking the time to chat with me tonight. Thank you for having me. Of I had so much fun. Congratulations. <laughs> thank on you. Your book. Thank Yay. you. Yay. Very excited about that too. Cheers. Thanks. <laughs> Happy reading, you guys. Bye. Bye.